shop, have you? Got any fans? Of the repair shop. So if you haven't seen it, it's where people bring in treasured family heirlooms that are a bit worse for wear and an amazing team of experts restore them to how they're meant to be, to their former glory. And on Thursday, I was finally able to take my mum and her beloved turn of the century musical Christmas tree holder to see Steve Kember, the music box expert in his shop in Rye. He was such a lovely man and under his care and expert eye, we learned all about the amazing musical instrument and saw it treated lovingly back to life so that it could play again. It was such a privilege to watch him at work. And it got me thinking that many of us may be feeling quite bruised and subdued after the trauma of the past year and other challenges that life has thrown at us. And like my mum's music box, we might feel in need of TLC and a bit of mending. And Jesus is our master restorer. He takes our pain and our worries and our doubts and our fears and he can retune them and make us sing again. And in his love, we have forgiveness and healing. And I also marveled at the fact that how much he cares for the intricacies of each of our lives, fine tuning each tiny part as Lord of creation, caring for every creature. As Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 29 to 31, for only a penny you can buy two sparrows, yet not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father's consent. As for you, even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. So I wanted to sing a song this morning that was just praising God for being Lord of creation and bringing us that healing and care that we all so desperately need. Thanks, Esther.
Thanks, Jenny. That was a really lovely reflection and great song as well. Um, Pam, are you all right to bring us our reading, yes. please? Thank you. All right. Our reading this morning is from Colossians chapter, chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. As you therefore have received Christ the Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pam. Um, let's sing our next song together. Come thou font of every blessing. to be let thy grace Lord thy 
Well, good morning again, everybody. Happy Pentecost. Um, let me pray for us and we'll get started. Come, Holy Spirit. Settle on us now as we dive into your word. Point us, point us back to Christ, whatever our weeks have been like. And set us on fire for him. In your name. Amen. All right, if you, um, if you wanted to have your Bibles open at that passage, um, Colossians 2, verses 6 to 15, you might find that helpful. Um, it's up to you as we go through it. Um, but before we dive into that, let's recap briefly what we learned the week before last when we started looking at Colossians. Well, firstly, this is a very young, inexperienced church, made up largely of people who've only just become Christians. Secondly, they're passionate about God and keen to grow in faith, but they're being influenced by some false teachers that have started visiting the church. And these teachers are trying to convince the Colossians that Christ alone is not enough for a fulfilling and saving relationship with God, and that they should instead place circumcision, dietary rules, and secret wisdom at the centre of their faith and practice. Thirdly, Paul has reminded them in no uncertain terms that Christ is the centre and the circumference of their faith and that nothing else will do. So that's where we are as we come to Paul's next major point to the Colossians, which is that Christ is not just the centre of the whole universe, the Lord of creation and new creation, and the only way to be reconciled to God. He's also the means by which the Colossians can obtain the spiritual growth and maturity that they desperately want. You see, there was a reason that these new teachers were causing such a stir in the new Colossian church, and that's because they appealed to a really deeply felt need. The new Christians were hungry for more of God, and the newcomers promised them that there was more of God out there, beyond what Jesus alone could offer. To such people, their message must have sounded vibrant and exciting. Now, last time we were saying that Christ is the beginning, the middle and the end of the Christian journey and that we never outgrow him. This is absolutely true, but Paul would be the first to admit that there is a need for all Christians to move beyond the basics of faith into increasing maturity, to come to know Jesus more deeply. In Hebrews, he actually tells off his readers for remaining spiritual infants who crave spiritual milk rather than solid food. They're stuck on the basics of what he's taught them and seem unwilling to learn more, unwilling to move on. The problem with the new teachers wasn't that they were pushing the believers to become mature in their faith. That's important, essential even. The problem was that they were pointing to a source of growth other than Jesus. In contrast, Paul says this. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. In other words, Christ is the root of the plant, but he is also the stem the leaves and the flowers. The false teachers were right when they said that receiving Christ was the beginning of life, not the end. But their mistake was trying to grow beyond him rather than in and through him. By removing him from his rightful place at the centre and replacing him with what Paul calls hollow and deceptive philosophy, they were building a rickety shack on top of a solid foundation. I've just got that picture of the shack Johnny stayed in being blown about by the wind. Paul wants to reassure the Colossians that despite what the newcomers might tell them, they are complete in Christ. He wants them to know that they already have fullness in Christ, fellowship with Christ and freedom through Christ. That's fullness in Christ, fellowship with Christ and freedom through Christ. First, what does it mean to have fullness in Christ? Look at verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So in Jesus lives everything that makes God God, and if you know Jesus, then you know God. It's that simple. But there's a bit more to it than that. Just as God dwelt in all his fullness in Jesus, 
so he dwells in all his fullness in us. And that's what we're celebrating here today in Pe at Pentecost. That God, the Holy Spirit, has made us his temple, his permanent dwelling place. The Spirit works throughout our lives to soften our hard hearts, open our closed minds and strengthen our feeble wills. Through him, we become all that we were made to be, the new humanity that we talked about last time. But it's important to remember that without the cross, there could be no Pentecost. It is in Christ and through what he has done that we are brought to fullness. God, in all his goodness, could not have come to dwell in our hearts if the sins that lurked there had not been dealt with. Nor could our hearts bear his presence. And that is where our fellowship with Christ comes in. Our passage tells us that what Christ did for us, God the Father applies to us. Because he died, our old lives die with him. Because he was buried, our sins were buried with him. Because he was raised to new life, we were raised with him. Baptism is a symbol of this, but it reflects a true reality, something that's actually happened. Because he gave up his body, a flesh that could be tempted and torn, we can be spiritually circumcised and set apart for God. And that's why, despite what the false teachers said, the Colossians did not need to be circumcised, because in the only way that mattered, they already had been. Listen to how Paul sums up the fellowship the Colossians have with Christ. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins and cancelled the legal charges we faced, nailing them both to the cross with Jesus. And once we were forgiven, he could come and dwell in us by his spirit. The false teachers promised that there was more of God out there beyond what Christ could offer. But in the spirit, we already have God in all his fullness. And we have that because of our fellowship with Christ. The final thing Paul tells the Colossians they have is freedom through Christ. Partly this means freedom from the Jewish law with all its dietary rules, sacrifices and complex festivals. But it also means freedom from the basic principles that control the rest of the world. Things like politics, economics, prejudice, superstition, inequality. These things haven't gone away. We can look at the news to find that out. But they are no longer the center of our existence and they no longer need to dominate our thoughts and actions. Instead, Christ is the center and we walk according to the spirit of Christ. But there's a third type of freedom Jesus offers. Freedom from what Paul calls the elemental spiritual forces and the powers and authorities. By this he means the devil and his allies that wage war against the people of God. The false teachers probably claimed that they had special knowledge of these powers, perhaps how to control and defeat them. But Paul thinks that this claim is ridiculous for the simple reason that they are already defeated. Verse 15 says this, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, God made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When a, a Roman general conquered an enemy city or put down an uprising, the defeated prisoners of war would be stripped of their weapons and armour and paraded through the streets so that the people could see that the battle was indeed won and that there was no longer anything to fear from these formerly quite scary enemies. And that's exactly the picture that Paul uses here. The enemy has been robbed of all his ammunition and left with no way to accuse us before God. It's a bit ironic because at the cross, these powers probably felt that they had stripped Christ naked, made him a public spectacle and triumphed over him. But in fact, the reverse was true. Their defeat was total and we were set free. And those the sun sets free are free indeed. So what does all this mean for us today? Well, that depends. Do you want to mature in your faith, to know more of God and to grow into his image? If the answer is yes, then great. The technique is really simple. If you know Jesus, then you already have all that you need. 
Continue to live your lives in him, walking according to the spirit of God that lives within you. And that same spirit will draw you deeper into the mystery of God and all that he has done for you in Jesus, continually pointing you back to the cross. Let no one, not even fellow Christians, judge you for what you eat or drink, festivals you observe or don't observe, and the other ways you may practice your faith. These things are but a shadow. The reality is found in Jesus. And be overflowing with thankfulness, praising God that whilst we were still dead in our sins, he made us alive with Christ. Amen. And we're going to sing um, Oceans together. Thanks, Esther. Savior. 
Chris, are you leading us in our prayers? Yes, that's right. Thank you. <clears throat> Let us pray. Today is the Christian Church's birthday, and we think of the wonder that must have been felt by those 3,000 people as they were able to understand each other, although they were speaking different languages. We may not speak in different languages, but how often do we listen to and understand the word and viewpoint of others as we seek to live our own busy lives? So often we might give cursory attention and miss cries for help. Bring us to spiritual fullness, O Lord, so that we really listen to others and to respond when we see or hear of others in need. Jesus told us that when we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, invite strangers in, clothe the naked, give comfort to the sick, sick, or visit those in prison. It is as if we are doing these things for him. Open our hearts as you opened the hearts of those early Christians who shared what they had with each other. For the past 11 days, we have watched the news with horror as bombs have rained on the Gaza Strip and Israel. 228 Palestinians, including 63 children, and 12 Israelis, including two children, have died. We pray for all the families who have lost loved ones and ask that they find strength and comfort in their loss. It is hard to understand this situation and where it fits in with your world, Lord, but we know that all violence comes from human beings. How must you be weeping at what we have done to your world? We thank you that there is now a ceasefire and that humanitarian aid is arriving in Palestine. We ask that the UN will seek to broker a lasting peace and that Palestine, Palestinians are treated justly so that they can live in peace and that their children can grow up without fearing what the future will hold. We thank you for the continuing progress of the vaccine programme which is enabling us to enjoy new freedoms such as seeing friends and families indoors. We pray for the areas which are seeing surges of another new variant and ask that the public health experts are successful in getting numbers back down. We think of our brothers and sisters across the world and we pray particularly for the situation in Nepal, where the people, although they aren't in the news, are experiencing a high number of cases and suffering because of lack of equipment and oxygen. We thank you that people responded generously to the Baptist Assembly appeal to help with the vaccination program in Nepal, raising money for equipment and for training healthcare workers. We ask that that the money can swiftly go to where it's needed so that the Nepalese people get the help they so desperately need. We bring before you our own church during this time of Sarah's sabbatical. We thank you that we have members who have been able to lead services and give insight on our theme of Jesus as the centre. And we thank you for the visiting preachers and the teaching that they have brought and will bring. And we pray for Sarah as she seeks to have a sense of God's presence during her time of refreshment. We pray for our church as it goes through a transition period. We thank you for the listening meeting last Sunday with its chance to meet with Simon Jones and to discuss the future of Fourfield Baptist Church. We have so many ideas of how we may engage with our local community, but it's so hard to know what it is you want us to do. We realise we need to spend time in quiet and listening to your still, small voice. So we will now be silent for a short while to enable you to speak to us and for us to listen out for your voice.
As we bring our prayers to a close, we think again of that first Pentecost and ask that more people experience the joy and fulfilment of being filled with your Spirit. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my works too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chris. Let's sing our final song together. Build your kingdom here. Thanks, Esther.
Let me just pray for us as we end our service together. If I leave up the wall, will happen. My heart of it all together. Spirit lead us where our trust is without borders. Let us walk upon the waters, wherever you would call us. Take us deeper than my feet could ever wander, and our faith will be made stronger in the presence of our Saviour. And may we go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And uh, yeah, we finished a bit early, but with that, our service is ended. Thanks, Matt.